Going over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Hello there, it's six o'clock and I am Michelle Dubery. Today it is well Down Syndrome Day. You know, I've got my bright, colourful, odd socks on. Give you a little shimmy with that. Because as I said, it is well Down Syndrome Day. But did you know that in this country you can abort your baby right up until the day it's born if it has Down Syndrome? The MP Liam Fox wants to stop that. Do you agree with him or not? And get this, thousands of so-called waspy women are owed compensation due to the way that changes in their state pension was managed. So should they get it? Will they get it? And who will pay for it? And we talk about building houses all the time, don't we? But you know what? It's time to move the conversation on. Never mind houses. Do you think we need to start building whole new towns? If so, tell me where. Also, council tax rises have been announced today. How much is yours going up? Also, Kemi Badenoch says that workplace diversity courses are snake oil. Is she right? Yes, indeed. That's all to come over the next hour. But before we get stuck in, let's cross live for tonight's latest news headlines. Michelle, thank you very much indeed and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom today is that the Bank of England has held the interest rate at 5.25% for the fifth time in a row. The Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey, said the economy isn't yet at the point where rates can be lowered, but he said things are moving in the right direction. People in Hull have been telling GB News what they thought of the latest interest rate figure. But it concerns me about the elderly who are just on old age pensions because uh, uh, that affects them quite a lot. And young families as well, you know, particularly single parents. You don't really get much if you think about it. If you look in your bank and you f look at it, it's not really that much because you've got your bills to pay. And if you've got like debts or anything to pay, that's just then going to go. So you're not going to see it in the benefit. I've been working in hospitality, which isn't the best, the best industry for an income. Um, so I was struggling. I was struggling to keep afloat and therefore I've had to... Had to move back in with my parents up here. Well, in other news today, thousands of women born in the 1950s may be eligible for compensation after a report found that the Department of Work and Pensions failed to adequately inform them that the state pension age was changing. The Parliamentary and Health Service Ombudsman looked at potential injustices resulting from the decision to raise women's retirement age to bring it in line with men's in 2010. Well, the Women Against State Pension Inequality campaign, WASPI, is suggesting there should be £10,000 in compensation for each woman claiming they weren't properly warned about the changes. The new report suggests, though, they should receive a payout of between one and £3,000. Shadow Home Secretary Yvette Cooper says it's important to take the report, though, very seriously. 
I think this is a really important issue because many women across the country just feel like they had the goalposts moved from them at the time when they didn't know what was changing. And so that's why I think it's really important that we look at this report. I haven't seen it yet, but I know that people will be looking really seriously at it. Yvette Cooper. Well, the WASPI chair, Angela Madden, says she's pleased with the news so far. Three years ago, in July 21, the Ombudsman agreed with us that the DWP had got it seriously wrong and maladministered the changes to the state pension age. Um, not ever so happy with the suggestions he's made to the government, but I'm really glad that he's laid the paper before the government because I think it needs to be debated in the House. Angela Madden of the WASPI campaign. Now, in other news today, Number 10 says it's dealing with a migration emergency after a record number of asylum seekers crossed the English Channel yesterday. 514 illegal migrants were picked up by Border Force officials, and that's the highest daily number this year so far. And we understand today at least another 300 migrants have arrived across the Channel in six small boats. The government hopes to get its Rwanda bill into law by April the 18th, we hear this afternoon, and the Home Secretary, James Cleverly, says he's determined to deliver on the government's pledge to stop the boats. I am absolutely determined to get the legislation through the House to prevent Labour peers continually, continually delaying and obstructing what I am trying to do, what the government's trying to do, to break the business model of these criminal smuggling gangs, to deter people making those dangerous crossings across the Channel, to protect our borders and to stop the boats. James Cleverly. Meanwhile, a South Sudanese man have, has been jailed for piloting a dangerously overcrowded small boat across the English Channel as it made its way overseas last August. 31-year-old Khul Far Makar was caught steering the vessel with 52 migrants balanced on board, many of whom were forced to perch dangerously on each side of the inflatable boat. The Home Office has released this series of images. If you're watching on television, you can see them. Uh, they were taken by Border Force officials of the overcrowded boat in conditions across the English Channel. Now, Channel 4 says their investigation into the allegations against the comedian Russell Brand has, Brand has found no evidence that its managers were aware of any sexual allegations against him. In September, the 48-year-old was accused of rape, assault and emotional abuse after a joint investigation by the broadcaster and the Times and Sunday Times. Mr Brand has vigorously denied all accusations against him iPhone maker Apple has been accused in the US courts today of monopolising the smartphone market. In the case against Apple, brought by the US Justice Department, it alleges the company used its control of the iPhone to illegally limit competitors and consumer options. Apple denies the claim and has vowed to vigorously fight the claim. Four environmental protesters have pleaded not guilty to criminal damage at the Prime Minister's Yorkshire home. The Greenpeace activist draped Rishi Sunak's constituency house with anti-oil and gas bans last year. Each of the accused denied the charges of criminal damage to roof slates after the group was pictured sitting on the Prime Minister's roof whilst he was away on holiday. The two-day trial will start in July. The Queen has said today His Majesty King Charles is doing very well. She was on a visit to Belfast today in Northern Ireland. During her first engagement there, Queen Camilla was handed a Get Well Soon card for her husband, who's undergoing treatment for cancer. Meanwhile, the King himself has been meeting the new High Commissioners for Tanzania and Singapore at a ceremony in Buckingham Palace in London. Those are the top stories. If you want those GB News alerts, scan the QR code on your screen or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Thank you very much for that, Polly. I'm Michelle Jubri, keeping you company until 7 o'clock tonight. Alongside me in my panel, the former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the visiting professor at Staffordshire University, Tom Buick. Good evening, both of you Good gentlemen. Evening. Hi there. Uh, you know the drill on this programme, don't you? It's not just about us. It's very much about you guys at home. What's on your mind tonight? I've got a packed show coming up for you. Uh, there's lots I want to talk to you about. Housing, council tax. Have you got your uh, new rates through yet? Eye-watering. 
mind, by the way, uh, if councils were doing a lot of the stuff that they're actually supposed to, instead of spending uh, a lot of money wasting it, actually, on some ridiculous stuff. One on my panel, uh, you can guess which one, uh, a former councillor, so he has got a lot to say on that issue. I also want to talk about the thing that you've inadvertently come dressed as, Kelvin, uh -huh. because I want to talk about the new... Uh, it's all kicking off. Have you seen it? We've been covering it on GB News. Uh, but this whole notion of the St George flag that's been amended on these England kits, does it matter or not? As I said, Kelvin, uh, it's a very big coincidence, actually. Dress like it today. We'll get into all of that and more as the programme progresses. And I'm also, for the first time ever, I'm dabbling with interacting with you guys online as well. You can join that conversation, gbnews.com uh, slash view was nice to chat to those of you that are already there. But for now, I showed you my snazzy, odd, colourful socks earlier on, didn't I? I'm wearing them because today is World Down Syndrome Day. Now, someone who's very passionate about this topic is the MP, uh, Liam Fox. He joins me right now. Good evening to you, uh, Sir Liam. Now, you are very passionate about Down Syndrome. I've read your stories. You uh, grew up with a little boy next door, and that has really kind of um, affected your outlook. You've been very successful in your campaign. Campaigning, but it hasn't stopped for you yet, has it? You are uh, currently campaigning for yet four uh, additional changes. Tell us more. Well, we know that we have important thought because I'm just going to re-establish a connection with you and whilst I'm doing so because it's really important for me that everyone uh, can clearly hear what you're saying so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you uh, one of the reactions that Rishi Sunak had in PMQs today to a suggestion uh, that Liam Fox is making here about changing the law let's listen I'm grateful to my right honourable friend for his dedicated work in passing the Down Syndrome Act into law. Uh, as he knows, when the grounds for abortion were amended, Parliament agreed that doctors were best placed to make those difficult decisions with women and their families. Uh, and also, as he knows, it's been a long standing convention that it would be for Parliament to decide whether to make any changes to the law on abortion and that the, these, these issues have always been treated as an individual matter of conscience. So there you go. That's what Rishi had to say on the matter. Let's go back now uh, to the Conservative MP, Sir Liam Fox. We can hear you much better now, uh, as you were saying. So, yes, it was an anomaly in our that while the maximum decision for the last 24 weeks, the rule of 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 the rule uh, and clearly, that I don't think there's ever anyone who would enter, but until we change it, that's the reality. So I want to reduce that to the same age, in this situation, as we can see that from Dalton, that is the first part of people with one form of people with the other people with second class people. Indeed. Um, I do apologise because I thought your uh, sound was much crystal clearer, but unfortunately it's not. But I certainly got the gist of what you're saying, and I thank you uh, very much for your time. This, uh, I'll come over to my panel now. This is a very um, sensitive topic. If you weren't able to hear that clearly, let me just bring you up to speed. Um, the law in the land at the moment uh, where we currently are is that actually you can uh, have an abortion, but you get to a cut-off point. Now, what um, uh, Liam Fox was basically saying there, that if someone has, if they know that their child has got Down mm. syndrome, then actually they can uh, terminate that pregnancy mm. right up until, mm. essentially, the point uh, just before they're due to give mm. birth. He wants to change that. What he's trying to explain there is that these people, uh, they have a quality in law once they're born. So, essentially, what he would argue is they should have a quality of law, essentially, be treated like uh, most other children or babies or fetuses, whatever people want to use the terminology, as all the other pregnancies. Where are you on this? Um, right. So the situation was that this law, I think, has existed since 1967. That's true. I, I, I didn't know that you could carry... Uh, it's after 24 weeks, yes. normal... Uh, 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 you can't have the abortion. And with these children, it can la last the full term, or basically yeah. within half an hour. My, my view is that it is up to the parents. Now, the, the, so I wouldn't change the law. I, and I'm pleased that Rishi 
did not get involved in this and said it's up to up to each individual MPs and their conscience, which they go, if it were me, I definitely wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it because it is the parents who will have to carry the burden of the child. Now, that you might say, well, that's a very unfair thing. The child should be able to make their own decision. I would say, I would say, in relation to Downs, that is uh, and not an appropriate reaction. And anyway, the truth about the matter is the parents, after 24 weeks, will have made a decision. We are either going to have the abortion prior to 24 weeks or, almost certainly, we are not going to do that. So I, I, don't, I think this is an unnecessary law and I hope that it fails. Tom Buick? First of all, you, mean, you mentioned it's uh, World Down Syndrome Day. I think we should celebrate, obviously, the contribution uh, that those with... Down syndrome make. That's why I've got. Look, my, that's why you've got yeah. this wonderful. I, I'm getting on a bit now, so I can't. I need to be a bit more relaxed <laughs> with the way I got my socks on. But I think you can kind of see them there. Yeah. I've well, got to put them down. I'm, I'm getting on a bit now, everybody. If you're watching as opposed to listening Oof, on the radio, do not out. adjust your set. Uh, but look, um, on the serious point, you know, the debate here is: should Parliament pass into law a change to the 1967 Act that? Uh, Calvin just referred to there, and perhaps uh, unusually, some rare agreement uh, between Calvin and I, I absolutely agree that the law should not be changed. And the reason for that, Michelle, is because actually when you look at the number of so-called late terminations that take place, mm. um, actually 98% uh, of terminations take place with, uh, actually below 10 weeks, never mind below the 24 weeks. And when you look at the reasons for terminations, uh, so-called late gestation terminations that take place, they're often because of the health of the mother. In other words, there are change in circumstances. Um, I read some harrowing accounts earlier, actually, from a women's uh, reproductive charity that had captured some case studies uh, for late terminations. And, for example, women who were subject to domestic violence and didn't want to bring um, a child into the world. Financial situations, a partner who had died. In other words, there are very, very complex reasons for why parents, in a very rare situation, take a very, very difficult, morally charged decision about whether to go for a late termination. I mean, if um, Liam Fox was still with us, he, I'm sure, would be saying things like, um, he says, that on average, 25 babies with Down syndrome are aborted every year beyond, uh, sorry, uh, between 24 and 40 weeks. He says uh, it's an absolute travesty. He says people with Down syndrome are not second-class citizens. Uh, also, as well, he points out that this is the first generation, perhaps, where uh, the Down syndrome children are going to potentially outlive uh, their parents as well. So he's got some really interesting interesting uh, information. For me personally, I think this is a very sensitive topic and I'm very, um, I am kind of pro-choice for a woman. But then I think that there's also, when you look at some of the other um, caveats to this, because it's not just Down syndrome that this uh, affects, you can abort your child um, right up until essentially the day that that child is born. If they have uh, a condition such as a, a cleft, a cleft uh, lip, a cleft palate, a club foot, things like that. Now, what I think goes on sometimes is when you get diagnosed and you're going through your pregnancy, you want everything to be rosy. Your mm. biggest wish uh, as a potential prospective parent is that your child is mm. healthy. So when you find out, heaven forbid, that that's not perhaps the outcome that's you're going to be your destiny, then it's incredibly overwhelming. And then I imagine that a lot of people get frightened, especially when you hear, um, you know, terms like that, that for you, you might associate with, um, I don't know, some people call things disabilities when perhaps they're not really strictly speaking. And I think people get anxious and frightened frightened, but for me, it makes me incredibly sad that you can terminate a child on the basis of, for example, a cleft in this country, because a cleft can be treated with a minor uh, surgery. A club foot can be treated with minor surgery. Is Things it, are different I, I didn't, these days. I didn't know that was true. I didn't even know, frankly, that Down syndrome children could be terminated right up at, 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 at almost a full term. So, um, uh, look, I, Liam Fox is a clever guy. And uh, I, I very much doubt whether this is going to fly, though. Well, I think, I've just been told, I've got on good authority, third time lucky, I've been assured this time that everyone um, is going to be able to hear him absolutely crystal clear. Liam, I've brought everyone up to speed. I've been speaking on behalf of what I think you might be saying. I've been reading out some of your quotes. You've been saying uh, 25 babies uh, are aborted each year between 24 and 40. So I think I represented your position uh, reasonably well. But just if you will, uh, tell us briefly, though, why are you so passionate about this? My panel don't think you're going to be able to get it across the line. Uh, what would you say? Well, about that? Well, we'll, we'll see because 
the reaction of most MPs was the same as Kelvin, which was, I didn't even know that this was the case. Many of them think that in an era where we've been passing legislation um, on disability and equality, uh, that it's not tenable to maintain this differentiation in the law. And again, Kelvin's quite right. Given the level of diagnostics that we have, most parents will have made up their minds by the time they get to 24 weeks. So to have it extended on this case in, for these children uh, up to 40 weeks, I think is utterly unjustifiable in this day and age, and it needs to be rectified. But what would you say the flip side of this, uh, Liam, is that people will say, well, hold on, that's really well and good uh, for an outside individual to have this view, but when it's the parent, it's going to be their responsibility to bring yeah. up that yeah, child yeah. for life. Yeah. So shouldn't the actual final decision come down to that parent? Well, yes, and that, that, that decision is. And what we are proposing is that the age limit should be the same um, in abortion for children with Down syndrome as with other children. Diagnostics uh, are there. Uh, and this is an argument about disability rights, and it's an argument about equality, uh, not really an argument about abortion, although I understand how emotive that is. But I think it's very hard on this World Down Syndrome Day to say to the, many of the people that I met today, many of the children and adults, that you should be treated differently from the rest of the population when, the, when it comes to the choice about whether you could be aborted up to hours before you could be born. Yeah, it's a very, very sensitive um, topic. I think you do great work on this, I have to say. And I know people's uh, opinions at home will be divided, so I'm looking forward to um, hearing what people have to say. And I know also, Liam, uh, you know, I've heard you say before, you don't, you're very keen um, to explicitly focus on Down syndrome in this uh, kind of work. But do you know, is anyone uh, more broadly focusing on the points that I was just raising earlier on about, you know, some of these situations apply to things like cleft lip, cleft palate, club foot? Yes, well, I mean, we, we have to ensure that we have e equality, that we don't simply say to one group of people, you have less right to be born than, than anyone else. It's about making those judgments um, that we should have equality uh, across our law. We've got a lot of legislation in place to ensure that. Um, it's, it's about just making sure that we don't say to people, Down syndrome, you're less worthy than other people. And the reason that I wanted to bring in the Down Syndrome Act was to give us conditions um, that would actually improve the quality of life of people with some of these conditions, that for the first time in our law, we would recognize that people with specific syndromes required specific help. And I think uh, trying to ensure that we get a quality of life for people um, it is, is absolutely key to a society where we maximise the benefit of our society by maximising the potential of everybody within it. Indeed. Uh, just very briefly, Will, what's the next step for this? And we just heard, of course, Rishi Sunak's um, response. What's next? Well, it will be an amendment to the Criminal Justice Bill. Uh, it's not yet clear when the government's going to bring the Criminal Justice Bill back to the House of Commons, but it's at that point we will put an amendment down to law at the moment. Of course, there's a bigger abortion debate going on at the same time, away from this question of, of rights and disability, um, about the age limit itself. Uh, and so it's going to be an issue uh, that is debated quite hotly in the House of Commons. Indeed, we'll certainly follow it. But for now, thank you very much for your time. That's uh, the Conservative MP there, Sir Liam Fox. Thank you. Uh, I do apologise again just about uh, the mu slightly muffled sound there. It wasn't your ears, I can assure you of that. That will divide opinion, though. Tell me your thoughts. Where are you on this one? Coming up, I want to talk to you about the WASPy women. Should they be compensated? That's what a report says, which is all well and good at report stage. Is it going to happen? Should it happen? Who and how is it going to be funded? Tell me. See you in two. Free Speech Nation. Sunday nights from 7 p.m. I've got an idea. I think that all 30-year-olds should be given £10,000 from the banks of baby boomers. We've got a situation in this country now where millennials are the first generation in modern times expecting to be poorer than their parents. We, as 30-year-olds like me, are half as likely to own a house as people my age 30 years ago. In fact, the cost of a home in Britain compared to average incomes has as big a gap today as it did, wait for it, 
in the 1860s. It is a Dickensian situation. Now, I'm sorry about the housing crisis for your generation. You're not, though, are you? No, because you're I profiting am. from it. I'm profiting from it. Don't of course be ridiculous. You are. The house prices now, right. compared to that period. If this is the case, have, Benjamin. Have incomes gone up that fast? To, to penalise and punish the elderly when they have worked yeah. all their lives to put into the system and say it's your fault, whingy whiny, we're going to yeah, be envious. Um, but, but, no, Linda, no, we're no, being punished. No, we're, by the politics, so be we're the change you want to see in the world. Taxes, taxes, be the change. I am actually, and I'm about to tell you about the change I want to see in the world. Are you good? As long as you're not whining about it. I'm going to stop whining about it, but the re we are being taken advantage of at the moment to profit, to help the old. Mo most of taxpayers' money is spent in two departments, the NHS, so the health department, and the Department for Work and Pensions. Those departments disproportionately serve the older population. Now, I've got no issue with that, but let's not pretend, let's not pretend that it is not young working people that is paying for the public services for old people. So actually, we are having it hard, and I just look at the future, and we see a future of perpetually higher taxes to pay for this increasing ageing population, a shrinking labour force, and you're here saying so we've got nothing to worry vote. about. change how you vote. The young stop voting for mass immigration parties, the young, I haven't. stop voting for Immigr parties Sorry, just to, that just to point out, build houses. Immigrants actually pay taxes, pensioners don't. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Hello there, I'm Michelle Juber, keeping you company until 7 o'clock tonight. Now, uh, today is a big day for the WASPy women. I'm sure you've been following uh, this story, uh, but long story short, it was about uh, a group of ladies, there are many of them, I can tell you now, that had their state pension age adjusted, and many would argue they were not consulted properly, they weren't given the right amount of time and notice in order to plan their life. Well, we've been waiting a very long time now for a report to be out, and that report has landed today. Long story short, the Ombudsman then said that many of these women uh, indeed were treated uh, badly, I'm going to summarise it in that way, and in fact are due compensation. Well, uh, I can speak now to Sheila Simmons, she's a coordinator uh, for a WASPy group. Good evening to you. Is today a good day for you? Well, good evening, Michelle. Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag, actually, because we welcome the report after all these these months and years, 67 months. And we welcome the fact that the Ombudsman found that there was maladministration, that we needed an apology, and that we should be compensated. So we welcome those findings. So it was extraordinary to then find out that the DWP was refusing to accept the recommendations or the findings of the report. So what do you think is going to happen? I mean, I know what you would like to happen, obviously. You want uh, this full compensation to be paid in full and for the wrongdoings to be acknowledged and all the rest of it. But realistically, do you think that is going to happen? Well, we're not asking for our pensions to be paid back to 60. We're asking for compensation for the maladministration of the DWP in its communication failure. So what we would like now is the Ombudsman's put it back to Parliament we know a lot of MPs support us, so we can ask them now to step up and put their money where their mouth is. And some people watching this, um, the opinion will be divided. So there'll be many people in the camp that say, yes, go, ladies, uh, we have your back, we want this to happen. Then there'll be the flip side of it that perhaps say, yes, we, we, you know, we support you, solidarity, but times are, are tough, uh, the public purse is not as um, you know, bosoming as it once was. Times are hard, we can't afford it. What would you say to those guys? Well, it's all about political choices, isn't it? And also the other thing is that by raising our state pension age, the Treasury has saved a massive £181.4 billion. 
So to compensate us to the level that we would like, which the all-party parliamentary group has supported, which is um, a basic like £10,000 at least, uh, would be a fraction of the money that's been saved. See, and we're going to follow this story, I can assure you of this, because it really is um, of interest to many um, of our viewers. But for now, thank you very much for giving us your reaction on that. Kelvin, where are you on it? Well, we shouldn't give them a penny. Uh, we should say how sorry we are that they failed to understand that in 1995, the government of the day said that uh, in, in 15 years' time, after 15 years, we're going to um, uh, equalise pensions entirely appropriately. And in 2010, 15 years later, along came Cameron and he said, we're doing it. The fact is that these women failed to follow this, right, is their responsibility, as with things like, you know, versions of the capital gains tax being changed through, uh, through the, the Chancellor's statement just now. You are... And so I wouldn't pay them a penny. They're not entitled to it, in my view. Uh, the fact that they didn't use their eyes and their ears to protect their own their own future is an issue for them. And um, thank you and good night. And if we, Come can, can blimey, I, I can hear them. I can hear them, Kelvin. Good, I can hear you good. from here. I bet people be furious because I'm telling you now, I don't know, I don't know how you spend your spare time, uh, but many people will not be spending their spare time just randomly, casually listening out for pension announcements that may I, or may I not affect that, them in a decades plus time. Many, many, many women, only like I've got an example of one here. She got her letter about her pension two years uh, before she was expecting uh, to retire. So many people, some people, women, by the way, say that they never got any comms at all. And I mean, this report, this Ombudsman report, even validated that. It said that the communications uh, were lacking, to put it mildly. Tom? Well, it's back to business as usual on this panel because I could not disagree with Calvin Moore on that point. I mean, look, let's be clear here. There's two communication points. Calvin's quite right. The 1995 Act, which did signal that between 2010 and 2020, this equality law essentially would come in where we'd equalise pensions uh, for men and for women at 65. There are three million WASPy women affected. But what's important today, and I know it's not a legally binding judgment by the Ombudsman, but it's, a, it's an important... And why it took them five years, I heaven knows. But the point is, there's been an injustice here. DWP, Department of Work and Pensions, are you're really digging in on this. And actually, whilst I agree with Kevin up to a point that we can't afford 30-odd billion pounds in terms of the backdated payments, but I do think we can pay somewhere between the £1,000 and £3,000 compensation that the on Ombudsman is actually suggesting, which would be a fraction, really, of the price. And as um, my, my, my bet, said, by the way, Tom, is that a lot of the women are simply making it up. It's actually a good well, thing. It's you know, like, you know, like those could... compensation schemes where a lawyer writes to you and saying, "Have you have you ever had a Mercedes?" Say, say that you had no idea that the uh, that the fuel um, w w worked in that way. So uh, let, let, let's be clear. I, I am not in favour, and nor is the public purse in favour. We have some massive scandals coming down the track. We do. We've got billions going out the door with the post office, right? That's yeah. a taxpayer thing. We have the scandal of the the blood, the tainted blood. Now, that is a 20 to 30 billion pound. We are, as far as I know, under Labour, under Tory, under Lib Dem, we are completely skinned. I'm afraid we've got to say to these no. ladies, I'm very sorry, you have our apology for it, but we haven't got the money, and nor do we believe that all of you are at it, are, are, are suffering, and that the DWP, unusually, for somebody like me, I'm 100% behind them on this on this particular yeah. Waspy ladies, what do you make to what you've just had to hear um, from Kelvin? But, Tom, go on. We either respect the rule of law in this country or not. We either set up the ombudsman... It's not ombudsman. a law. It's, well, not it's, a law. It, it's not legally binding. No. But the point is, uh, an ombudsman, who's effectively an umpire, a referee, has agreed that the Department for Work and Pensions engaged in maladministration. And actually, it goes back to George Osborne's austerity years. I mean, I read a case from one of the Waspy women today who got a letter in March... 2013, that her pension was changed for another five years to March 2020, when she'd made her own personal retirement plans for the following year. Well, that's what she said. Thing to that's do. what she said. That's a reasonable thing to that's do. That's what she said. Well, I, what are you going to do? I mean, if I, if so, I, if I, if I thought really I was going to get 10, 10 grand by just agreeing that I, I was totally, totally... Look, if somebody is coming up to retirement, they are paying a lot of interest in, a, a lot of, on, on, what their, on, the, on what their payment is going to be. And, and, and I, what percentage of them are reliable? 
relying totally. Have you noticed how many have all come out saying we were relying on what was the pension be at that time? Say six thousand a year. Is that is that sure. if, if they were if they were relying on six grand a year to get through to get through life in in the in the in the mid two two thousand? Then they then they have a massive problem. Would you support and it's not a problem testing. I'm going to fund. Would you support means testing the compensation? So you have to put your case as to how you were financially. No, I'm not. I, they're not. They're not so going to get. For me, they're not getting one penny. I'm afraid. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not how the tax system works. They don't come to you, Kelvin, and go, right, you know, you've paid your PAYE yeah. or your uh, dividends or whatever it is. Uh, Please, sir, how do you... Do you mind if I spend it on I this? I totally agree with that, and it's down to Parliament, and that's why I'm saying to Parliament, we haven't got the money. I don't believe some of the women who are all, all not unreasonably saying, I wouldn't mind ten grand. In fact, I wouldn't mind three grand. Pay for a nice holiday, right? But I'm saying to Parliament, they should not... They should not bow at the knee to this. Otherwise, God knows how many other compensation claims are going what to be What are you going to do? Strap way. them onto a lie detector test? Uh, not a bad idea, actually. Most, oh, of, I'm most gonna, of them I'm will fail. Shut up, I'm most I'm, of them will I'm, fail. I'm, I'm, I can't even believe I'm giving the guy ideas. Uh, <laughs> Pam, Pam used to say, I really used to like Kelvin, but now I think he is an absolute bleep. I'll tell you what the bleep is in the break, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to ruin people's tea times by saying that. Um, Linda says, I can tell you, I don't think that the government will compensate these waspy women. Um, she goes on to say, a lot of pensioners, by the way still pay income tax. Yes, they do. So a lot of these people uh, potentially will still be uh, taxpayers. Philip says, I've got to say, it is a lot of men um, saying that they don't support this. Um, <laughs> Philip says, I was born in 1952 and I was treated very fairly. Uh, they weren't paying attention. Yes, but Philip, my love, uh, you're not a woman. I don't think that you will have had uh, your state pension age uh, change so quickly uh, with perhaps so little notice. Calf says, uh, was women absolutely deserve some recompense for the diabolical changes uh, that were made in such an untimely fashion. She says, yes, of course changes need to be made, but the way it was done was absolutely appalling. Mm. They don't like you very much, yeah. Kelvin. No, well, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm putting that mildly. I, I'm pleased about that because the truth about the matter is they, they, they will have known when they were going to retire. They had 15 years at the minimum to get this right. Why on earth weren't they concentrating on their future? In, in a positive way, and I'm afraid that they should have kept their what about ears, things, what about their things ears like, and their eyes open, and none of this would have happened. What about things like, I don't know, people that got divorced and they had their uh, settlements calculated on a particular retirement age and then all of a sudden uh, found out that they're going to have to work, I don't know, half a decade longer or whatever else it is? What about people like that? Well, I, n normally divorces are matters of great joy for one partner. And I and the, you can't he's mean. a pensioner, can't you? He's really, he's coming out with all the lines tonight. Um, <laughs> well, I can tell. I mean, I do have to say there are divided opinions. To be fair to you, Kelvin, there are a lot of people that are actually saying the same thing. William says, "Take some responsibility, women." Yep. I've got to say, it's mainly men that have that sentiment. How would you feel? I'll throw it back on you. All these men that get in touch, Kelvin, uh, and people like that saying it's the women's fault. How would you feel if you're, um, I don't know, you're planning your retirement at whatever age? Don't forget there was talk recently on some report that the retirement age could even go as high as 71. Um, would you be up for that? Would you think it would be cool? And if you missed it for whatever reason, you weren't communicated properly, would you suck it up and say, you know what, maybe it's on me? I bet you wouldn't. Get in touch and tell me, though, your thoughts. Do you be uh, views at GVNews.com? Com. I can hear you, I can hear those waspy ladies. Uh, his ears are going to be burning, is Kelvin McKenzie during the break. I can tell you that for free. Let's uh, talk housing when we come back. Never mind building houses. Is it time now that we just accept we've got to build whole new towns? Where on earth do we put these things? Tell me. I'll see you in two. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. Tomorrow will feel colder for all of us. A bit of a damp start in the south and then a mixture of sunshine and showers. Low pressure is dominating, but it's actually sitting up by Iceland. But these weather fronts draped across the UK. This one in particular is doing a couple of things, bringing cloud and rain, but also introducing the 
colder air. The rain will trickle southwards through this evening across northwest England and Wales. A fairly soggy evening and that rain spreading into the Midlands and southwest England by the end of the night. The far southeast staying mostly dry, staying pretty mild here, but colder air is arriving across the north. A chillier start here and very gusty winds through the night and indeed for most of Friday, particularly across northern Scotland, but also into the west coast of Scotland. Blustery showers, some snow over the highlands. Showers elsewhere for southern Scotland, northern Ireland, a dull, damp morning across the southeast, and the rain may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. But elsewhere, it will brighten up. We'll see some sunny spells, but it will feel colder. Temperatures only in single figures across the north, maybe 11 or 12 further south, quite a bit chillier than it has been through this week. Uh, a cold feeling start to the weekend as well. We may start Saturday dry and bright, but the cloud will bubble up and expect showers on Saturday. Some heavy downpours, rumbles of thunder, hail showers possible as well. And look at the numbers for Saturday. After being in the teens for most of this week, single digits for many of us, it is going to feel a lot chillier. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Hi there, I'm Michelle Dubry. It's all seven. He's still here. I've not uh, kicked him out. The former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, and the visiting professor at Staffordshire University, Tom Buick. You've divided opinion tonight, Kelvin. Uh, someone on Twitter got in touch and said, Michelle, you called uh, Kelvin my love. He says if a male uh, presenter said yeah. that to a woman, yeah. Mm. Yeah. the fella would be getting the boot. Don't Did worry. I call don't him worry. My love? Yes. And well, don't I take worry. It, I don't take it back. Well, I normally call him even far worse things. Everybody. I've already reported you to Ofcom. The chances of you, this show surviving are very. Oh, there's small. a long queue. Ofcom. Are, they're working through a long queue before they get to that one. I can the assure you. Of misogyny, by the way, is misandry. So Mis she's misandry. a misandrist. Misandrist. misandrist yeah. But you see, yeah. I think it's just dialect. Mm. It's just regional dialect. I called you love if I did call you love. It must have slipped out because that's not what I was thinking. Uh, I can tell you that. But, uh, yeah, well, regional dialects, are they no, no longer allowed on television? Am I going to get myself in trouble? Good grief. Um, look, so many of you getting in touch um, about this situation. Barbara wants your eyelashes back. Kelvin, she's missing those. Um, lots and lots of you. Carl says it was really great of Liam Fox to speak up on this difficult and sensitive issue. Uh, people with Down syndrome absolutely should always have the same rights and protections as every body else. Uh, Elizabeth said it's horrifying that she says in her words, uh, you can murder an unborn baby at full time just because it has Down syndrome. And many other things I've just explained as well. Uh, the cleft situation, the club foot. Gary says Down syndrome people are the most loving and kind mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Uh, Margaret, I love this. Uh, she says, can I just say um, Down babies are not ill. They just have an extra chromosome. And if you are lucky enough to be a parent of a, Down, uh, a baby with Down syndrome, you are blessed and special. I like that, Margaret, and I've got to say I completely agree with you. Thanks for all your thoughts you're sending in on that one. But now let's talk housing, because we dabble around these um, edges all the time, don't we? We'll, we know the situation. The population uh, is massively growing. The house building is not keeping up. Well, now there's plans to build 63,000 houses in and around Milton Keys. You guessed it. Uh, many people are outraged by that and don't want it to happen. Do you think this is where we need to get to, though, essentially building uh, just massive new towns? And if so, where? 
Absolutely. We're adding a city the size of Brighton and Hove to this country in population terms every single year. That's where I was formerly a councillor. Frankly, Michelle, we're not building enough homes. We need to be building 300,000 housing units a year. You fly over this country, um, the percentage actually of land, these great islands of ours that we're building on, is 6%. So the idea we don't have enough space to build these homes, we need to be building new towns, we need to be taking the NIMBYs on, but actually the elephant in the room is this. If we start building more homes, more supply in the market, it's going to result in a real terms decrease in uh, house prices. And I'm afraid for those that either own their homes or they're on the property ladder, they treat their homes like ATM cash machines, many of them, and they don't like the idea of house prices falling. Understandable, but we're not going to be able to house the population unless we get building. <sighs> Lots I want to say, but let me bring Kelvin in. Uh, well, I'm against new towns. Why? I am in favour. Well, because what happens with new towns and with the developers, it's an absolute scandal, is that when you have a development, what have you got? You've got loads of people. So have we got loads of doctors? Are there new clinics? Are there new hospitals? Are there new schools? Every, all these developers all promise this stuff. Then the damn stuff is never... Never think, uh, never built. And what you end up with is a group of houses, all with people having then to drive 20 miles to go to take part in uh, facilities. So I am in favour of existing towns being expanded. And I do accept totally that the Green Belt is an idea that doesn't work in an exploding population. So you tell me why it is we can't have homes where actually all, all that's happening on that, on that field is a horse. Mm. Right? Grazing. I, I just cannot understand how this argument has been that we're robbing the, the, robbing the world of, uh, of our countryside. We're not robbing it. I accept Tom's argument completely that we're going to have to build on it because otherwise, do you know what happens to rents? Do you want to have a rent? I mean, rents, rents around my way. I'm in North in the Surrey. Yeah. The rents there are literally, if you've got a terraced house, it's 2000 or 1900 a month. It is incredible. No, really. Two and a half grand for a, for a semi, right? I mean, and, and this is a place 20, 22 miles outside London. Mm. So uh, you live in Clapham, you live in Clapham or somewhere like that, you are literally now paying 1200 1400 pounds for a room, right? And, you, and there'll be four rooms, there are four rooms in the house. This cannot be solved unless we build more. Yeah. Go on. Are you saying, Michelle, we shouldn't be building more? Is that why you wanted to take an issue? No, I wasn't going to take an issue. What I was going to say is this whole notion that the population is expanding at a rate of knots, so therefore let's expand the houses at a rate of knots. I always just press pause and go, but hang on a second. Why aren't anyone actually saying that maybe what we should be doing is trying not to expand the population as quickly and all the rest of it as we currently are doing by ways of uncontrolled mm -hmm. immigration? Yeah, well, there's a debate about levels of net migration, but look at even the recent budget. I mean, the Office of Budget Responsibility, based on, obviously, the Tories' yeah. uh, changes to the mm -hmm. migration, um, the legal migration... Mm -hmm are still saying that even if it falls from the 700,000 net migration figure that we've had in the past couple mm. of years, it's going to be around 300,000. That's what I was saying about the size of a city of Brighton and Hove on the south coast. As Calvin's indicating, we've got to get building and, you know, we've got young people who are now spending something like 60, sometimes 70% of their... Uh, disposable income on rent. That's not sustainable. And actually, I think part of dealing with the NIMBY issue is that if we do uh, develop the new towns, it's going to be easier to get the planning permission. But you're right, Calvin, you need the GP surgeries, the primary school. You need all of the else. infrastructure, mm -hmm. yeah, and good luck finding all that, by the way. And you speak about rents and places like that. Well, uh, tomorrow, what I want to explore in a bit more detail is the so-called um, um, emergency, the migration emergency that the government have finally uh, decided to wake up and realise that we found ourselves in and you talk about rents and stuff like that you've got companies like people like Serco have you seen what they're doing at the moment good luck even trying to find uh, rental houses everybody but anyway we'll get into that properly tomorrow after the break I want to talk to you uh, about what Kemi Bednock has been saying when it comes to diversity I'll see you in two Mark Dolan tonight weekends from 9 p.m. I've personally been very torn on whether Prince Harry should have full police protection when he's in the United Kingdom. On the one hand, why should taxpayers fork out for somebody that's left the country and the institution? He is no longer a working, serving royal. But I don't think it matters. He is one of the most famous men in the world, and whether he's a royal or not, he is an ambassador for this country. And he still does good. 
charitable causes, the Invictus Games, and he is still a nice and charming guy with a heart. And whilst he has left the royal family and departed these shores, he was and remains the son of King Charles. That is a biological fact. Well, let's hope so. And it wasn't his choice to be born into royalty. It wasn't his choice to be the son of the king. And for that reason, I think he should have equal police protection to his brother William when he is in this country. He couldn't be a more high-profile figure, and unfortunately, like all the royals, Harry will be a target for some very bad people. I fear that if, God forbid, anything happened to him or his family, the authorities would have blood on their hands. So, it's not often that I back Prince Harry, but on this one, he has my support. Look what happened to his poor mum, killed in a Paris tunnel in the 1990s with an allegedly drunk chauffeur. A top royal security insider recently told me that Diana would still be with us today if she had had top royal protection at that time. So let's not make the same mistake twice. Prince Harry needs full protection and the best we've got. Yes, he might be a numpty, but he's our numpty. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Hello everyone, I'm Michelle Drew Brittle 7, the former editor of The Sun, Kelvin McKenzie, also known as, you like the poster boy now for the, the man that women, waspy women, don't like anymore. Oh, good. Yeah, Excellent. I, I don't think he cares, Excellent. but I'm listening to you waspy ladies, I hear you, I appreciate you. Anyway, also alongside me, the visiting professor at Staffordshire University, Tom Buick. Welcome back, everybody. Let's get straight in, shall we, uh, and talk about the next topic, diversity, because Kemi Badenoch, she basically says all these workplace diversity courses are essentially just snake oil, apparently. I mean, don't be under any illusion, right? This is such a massive industry yeah. in this country. Uh, get this right. The UK employs almost twice as many diversity and inclusion workers per 10,000 employees than any other country. The public sector, there's more than 10,000 public diversity and inclusion jobs at a cost of £557 million a year. Tom Buick. Well, it's the new health and safety officer racket, isn't it? Again, you know, I don't, having been a CEO to five organisations since the age of 34, I do take the responsibility that we don't want discrimination in the workplace. And I think training on uh, anti-discrimination is important. But it's just got to the point now where, um, you know, effectively a whole industry has been, you know, sprung up to effectively, uh, you know, coin it out of um, a lot of companies. And some of it may be... Useful. I don't completely agree with what Baden Dock's saying about it's the new snake oil. But that same survey you quoted there, uh, Michelle, interestingly, two thirds of British employees also said that they'd look for a new job if their employer didn't take diversity and inclusion seriously. So there's a there's a generational shift, I think, in the workplace where actually this is something now that people expect. Kevin. Well, you know, if you are a, if you are an employer. Um, the idea that the, the quality of many of the people turning up for your job is absolutely astonishingly awful. And the idea but, that but you are... Because they know they're going to work with you, so they send all the bad ones. Yeah, right. The idea, the idea that you are going to discriminate as a boss against a clever black person, brown person, somebody from the Far East, is absolutely preposterous, mm. right? What, where it doesn't help very much, actually, fun enough, is the number of diversity officers um, that were 
Um, uh, and this was this was the point, by the way, that the um, that Dyson made to um, to Jeremy Hunt the other day. The the number of diversity people in hospitals is off the scale, and yet and yet the one minority within hospitals is white medical staff. I mean, you know, mm. for, for a thousand and one different reasons. So I I. My, my point about this is we shouldn't need them because we don't have enough good people generally. And I do not believe I know one single boss anywhere who would discriminate against, against anybody. They are desperate for good people. Mm, well, there you go. You'll have some thoughts on that. Also, when we're talking about uh, this new like diversity, this inclusion thing, a uh, story, I mean, we've covered this, I think, yesterday, at least uh, on GP News. Have you seen this? It's about the New England uh, shirts. Kelvin's got his ties almost yep. dressed as it. Um, yep. They've come under fire. Nike basically they've said that they've amended the St George uh, flag on the back of these um, England uh, strips because they say mm. they want to unite and inspire mm. this is a yeah. playful uh, modification Where are you uh, uh, totally wrong can you imagine doing that to Scotland can you imagine a, a, a Scottish a, 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 the people of Scotland embracing the change to their flag from blue Honestly, I cannot understand it. You know what it's about, don't you? It's actually about uh, people, and, and we don't need an American company to do this either. We, we, it's actually about the fact that they look upon that that red cross as some kind of right or far right mm. uh, flag. And agree, honestly, yeah. it is so so wrong. And and and, and I, I see that the FA, are, you know, the FA is a correct description of, of probably most of the executives in it, but. Uh, they say that they're sticking by it. They should not stick by it. We should insist on it being changed. Tom? I think the key point here... And boy, um, Calvin's Mr Angry uh, this evening, yeah, isn't he? Very um, angry. I think the key point here is, look, this is our, our national kit. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, it's a well-established principle in sport, internationally around the world, that the, you know, the national kit is not a commercial kit. This should not be uh, used by Nike as so, you know, the latest Air Jordan range and they want to show a bit of creative flair. I think that's really the key point. So, absolutely terrible idea. Well, Keir Starmer, is, uh, even he said, apparently, uh, that they need to reconsider. Uh, the it made me laugh, though, because the hypocrisy in all of this. Nike, they reckon what? That they want to unite and inspire. Don't make me laugh. This is the same brand that sit there. Do you remember? Uh, was it Mary Epps, the uh, goalkeeper shirts? If you want to inspire, they didn't even make a replica of her shirt until they were forced to by a uh, public outcry. If they want to unite, why do they use biological men, that Dylan Mulvaney guy, to model female uh, women's sports bras? I mean, give me an absolute break. Anyway, thank Thank you so much for all of the stories that you've been sending me about your family pictures. I love them. Thank you. Uh, gents, that's all I've got time for. Farage up next. Have a good night. Na night. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Welcome to your latest weather update from the Met Office for GB News. Good evening to you. Tomorrow will feel colder for all of us. A bit of a damp start in the south and then a mixture of sunshine and showers. Low pressure is dominating, but it's actually sitting up by Iceland. But these weather fronts draped across the UK. This one in particular is doing a couple of things, bringing cloud and rain, but also introducing the colder air. The rain will trickle southwards through this evening across northwest England and Wales. A fairly soggy evening and that rain spreading into the Midlands and southwest England by the end of the night. The far southeast staying mostly dry, staying pretty mild here, but colder air is arriving across the north. A chillier start here and very very gusty winds through the night and indeed for most of Friday, particularly across northern Scotland, but also into the west coast of Scotland. Blustery showers, some snow over the highlands. Showers elsewhere for southern Scotland, Northern Ireland, a dull, damp morning across the southeast, and the rain may linger in Kent well into the afternoon. But elsewhere, it will brighten up. We'll see some sunny spells but it will feel colder. Temperatures only in single figures across the north, maybe 11 or 12 further south, quite a bit chillier than it has been through this week. Uh, a cold feeling start to the weekend as well. We may start Saturday dry and bright, but the clouds will bubble up and expect showers on Saturday. Some heavy downpours, rumbles of thunder, hail showers possible as well. And look at the numbers for Saturday. After being in the teens for most of this week, single digits for many of us, it is going to feel a lot chillier. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News.
there's still time to win our giveaway packed with seasonal essentials. First, there's an incredible £12,345 in tax-free cash to be won. Cash to make your bank account bloom. Plus a spring shopping spree with £500 in shopping vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. And finally, a garden gadget package, including a handheld games console, a portable smart speaker and a pizza oven. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,000 £345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard